I have no idea where we are. We're, yes, yeah, we're in Lubbock. I think we're ready to start Genesis 18. Let's open with prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we praise your name for all of your goodness, especially that you hear the prayer of your saints. So hear our prayer this morning in the name of your son, Jesus, that you would open the word to us, that we would come to know him, that we would fear your wrath and believe all the more firmly in your grace in Jesus Christ, through whom we pray. Amen. All right, so we left off the end of 17. Um, Abraham circumcises himself, his household, to include his children, his slaves, their children. And now Abraham is still living in Mamre. And we're going to pick up chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre, as he sat by the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. Okay, so Abraham is living in his tent by the oaks of Mamre. Um, the idea that he lifts up his eyes and sees indicates he doesn't see the men approaching from a long way off on the horizon and then slowly, slowly, slowly. It's more like he just looks up and there they are. Now, there are three men. What are we told about the three men? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> yeah, they, they appear, they're standing, and that's it. They're not given names, they're not given an origin, they're not given a purpose or anything, it's just there are three men. Now, Abraham, again, 99 years old, he sees the men standing at the tent, and what does he do? He runs. He runs to meet them. Running to meet someone is an indication of what? Yeah. Excitement, Excitement and a little bit to, that you have a lower status. You know, if, if, if the king is out walking through the countryside, he's not going to run to meet the person. Rather, the, the person that encounters him on the road will run to him. Abraham runs to these men, and when he sees them, he does what? He bows, right? Just, and the word is literally just bows like, like this, you know. And what, how does he address them? O oh Lord. Um. In the Hebrew, it's a little bit more obvious that he's addressing the Lord. Now, this is not Jehovah. This is not the Tetragrammaton. Uh, nonetheless, the way that he, that he expresses this indicates he's, he's praising God, the Lord. Because, I mean, after all, like Sarah calls Abraham Lord, right? That doesn't mean Sarah thinks Abraham is God. Yeah, that's a, that's a little L Lord. <laughs> this is a big L Lord. Not an all caps, Lord. What, what is Abraham wanting to, to do for the men? Yeah, he's, he's wanting to, to show them hospitality. This is a major theme of this section of the Bible. But he's, he's racing to demonstrate hospitality. This, this is... I mean, culturally, very much how they operate. You can see a map of like places in the world where if you visit, you're, you're going to be given food. <laughs> Scotland, Northern Europe, not necessarily so much. The middle of Europe, maybe. Southern parts of Europe, the Mediterranean, you will be sent home. If you go to a house in Serbia and you refuse food, 
don't don't do that. Don't do not refuse the food. It's it's insulting. Kind of works the same in the U.S., right? <laughs> in the North, you may, you may not. In the South, you're going to be given a, a, a Cool Whip you know, bowl full of food. It is, it is absolutely a stereotype, and it's 100% true. Yes, right, yeah, it could be a butter dish. The, the first way he's going to demonstrate this is he's going to wash their feet. And obviously, you can't help but think of John 13, Jesus washing the disciples' feet. He's showing them that same sort of hospitality. So he, he asked for some water. And again, this is, this is a very practical thing, right? Someone's been traveling. You wash their feet. They feel refreshed. They feel clean. Um, it's also it's humiliating. And by humiliating, I don't mean degrading. I mean it's you are bringing yourself low. In the case of washing feet, you bring yourself physically low in the presence of the other, right? So on the one hand, this is an act of hospitality. On the other hand, this is for Abraham an act of worship. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seahs of fine flour knead it, and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a young calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. So we've, we've talked about this before. Abraham is described as being rather wealthy, substantially wealthy. But notice, here's, here's a faithful man. I mean, he's, he's our father in the faith using that wealth for hospitality. So he's in a position where he can order up large amounts of flour to be used, not for, not for their survival, but for the reception of these guests. And then, of course, you've got a young calf ready to go, slaughter the calf, have it prepared, likewise for the young men. Uh, nine, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. So, the purpose of the visit is that the young men want to see Sarah. The Lord's already spoken to Abraham. Now, when Abraham laughed, his laugh was more out of joy. That's going to be contrasted with what's going to come a little bit later. But his laugh was more out of joy, like, that's, that's wonderful. Um, but they're there to see Sarah. And remember... With the birth of Jesus, was it Mary or Joseph who received a vision from the angel? They both did. First Mary, then Joseph. So both Abraham and Sarah are going to receive word from the angels about, about Isaac. And again, we've already been told his name. That happened in the last chapter. Isaac won't be born until chapter 20. But again, the Lord plans all of this out and everything happens in a very methodical, planned out sort of way. I mean, this, this demonstrates that he's in control. Again, if you're a baseball fan, you know, the, it's, it's iconic for Babe Ruth to call a shot. Why? Because to know that you're going to hit the ball, where you're going to hit the ball, and to do it demonstrates you have control of the entire field. That's, that's a level of mastery that not many possess. That's what the Lord's doing here. Everything's happening, happening very methodically. There's nothing chaotic about it. So now he's going to come to Sarah. The, the, the question is, how did he know these weren't just men? He, he does know, but I don't think we're told how. But you're right. He, 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 he knows. He knows who they are. Luther goes one step further. Luther says, hey, Abraham lived long enough he got to meet like six of the patriarchs. Abraham probably listened to Shem's preaching. Luther thinks that Abraham knew this, this was at least representative of the Trinity. It can't be the Trinity because of John 1, but it's representative of the Trinity because he heard the doctrine of the Trinity from Father Shem. That's a bit speculative, but it is certain that, that the patriarchs had knowledge of the Trinity. 
Maybe they didn't have the, the full formulation of the Nicene Creed, but they know. Right, they just appear. And, and, this, and, and this is what we're going to find out in, in verse 10. Because look at what Moses writes in verse 10. The Lord said, I assume that, that what that means is that one of the men is the Lord. That is to say, the pre-incarnate Son. We've had these before. We're going to have more of these later, these theophanies, where the Lord himself appears and, and speaks to his saints. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, Am I worn out? Or, or I'm sorry, after I am worn out, and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? Um, so the angels are going to tell Abraham in brief what they're here to see Sarah about. Namely, well, in another year I'm going to return, and by that time you're going to have a son. And by the way, it's not just you, Abraham. It says what? Your wife, Sarah, will have a son. None of this Hagar business. Sarah will have a son. So the promise is the son will come from your body, Abraham. And now the promise is the son will come from Sarah's body as well. So the son of Abraham and Sarah, not Abraham and Hagar, not Eliezer of Damascus, but their very own son, Isaac, about this time next year. Now Sarah's listening at the door. And we're told, you know, the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. In other words, she's not, she's not naturally fertile any longer. Right, right. And so she, she laughs to herself, and it, the way this is written indicates she's, she's laughing in such a way that she doesn't think she's heard. You know, she's kind of behind the doorpost, she's listening in, she kind of chuckles within herself. And she's kind of scoffing, you know, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? In other words, will, will there be a fulfillment of this thing, despite the fact that my Lord is old, that is to say, Abraham is old, and also, you know, I am old, Sarah says. Verse 13, the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now, now that I am old? Oh, he heard that. <laughs> He's the Lord. Now, in verse 10 and verse 13, in this case, the Lord is, you know, Je Jehovah. It's, it's the Tetragrammaton, right? The, the same name that the Lord gives to Moses from the burning bush. You know, I am. So not just, not just the Lord, but specifically, you know, the Lord by name. You know, why did Sarah laugh? So Abraham laughs out of joy. Sarah kind of laughs out of scoffing. And uh, in verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? Uh, the older translations have, have, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? And that, that is the literal meaning. Um, but realistically, that's, that's, what it, that's what it means, is anything too wonderful for the Lord? Is anything too, too grand for the Lord? Is anything too difficult for the Lord? So you cheated and looked at Hebrews 11. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, so Hebrews 11 says, by faith she received power to conceive, which is fascinating to me because it... The, the, the way that it's phrased indicates that Sarah, Sarah doesn't exactly have a part in this, like she's doing something, and yet her faith is what permits her to conceive. That's not a general, like, anybody that's over the age of 90 years old, if you just believe hard enough, I mean, there are plenty of preachers that do that kind of thing. That's not what's going on, because there was a specific promise. Yeah, usually on TV, they usually want your money. Um, I mean, a propeller plane is not going to get the gospel around the, the world fast enough. They need that jet. Um, but Sarah had a specific promise that she would conceive. And she believed the Lord, as Abraham did. And, 
and now she's she's listed among the saints and specifically committed for her faith and 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 she conceived she believed At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. She's afra- I mean, she's afraid. She laughs and she knows she shouldn't have. But notice, it's not, well, Sarah laughed, therefore the deal's off. I mean, yeah, God made a promise, and... She believes the promise. We we find ourselves in the same position sometimes, though, right? We know the goodness of God. We know His promises. We believe them, but it is it does sometimes stretch our credulity. You know, it. You you look around and you think the Lord's going to redeem these people, the Lord's going to redeem this world, the Lord's going to call this church. I mean. You, you look at the promises of God and you, you, you think, you, you start processing how difficult they are, not thinking the way the Lord does is anything too, too difficult for the Lord. You do laugh sometimes. <laughs> and that's where Sarah is, you know. But with Abraham, with Sarah, with Lot here in a little bit, you're going to see wild imperfections, even outright sin in the saints. And yet they're still committed for their faith. They're still reckoned as righteous. And they're in heaven. They're not dead. I mean, again, remember, and this is the lesson that the Pharisees did not get, Abraham is not dead. That's the thing Jesus was trying to teach the Pharisees they couldn't get. Abraham is not dead. Abraham died many years. He's not dead, guys. Abraham believed the Lord. It was reckoned him as righteousness. So you, you see faith play itself out in a way that seems very familiar to us. That these are, these are not perfect people. That doesn't excuse their sin. But the Lord will nonetheless work through them. 16. Then the men set out from there and they looked down toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. This is, an, this is an inter-Trinitarian conversation. This is a conversation between the persons of the Trinity. We're not given to, to sit in on many of those. The question is, you know, do, do I reveal to Abraham? Abraham's going to become a great nation. He's going to become the father of a multitude of nations. Because what's he about to do? Yeah, he's, he's, he's about to rain you know, hellfire on, on Sodom and Gomorrah. There's, there's going to be some testing of Abraham as, as, as well. That, that is to demonstrate that his faith is genuine. 22. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom. By the way, where is Sodom? Well, it's nowhere now. There's a reason for that. <laughs> it's... It's just, it's just a little bit south of the Dead Sea. It may have been green and lush at one time. Uh, it is not now. For reasons, it'll be all too clear in a minute. But yeah, this is, this is south of the Dead Sea. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood still before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Verse 23 is going to indicate what's going on in the rest of this chapter. Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Because remember, in the days of Noah, did the Lord sweep away the righteous with the wicked? No. The righteous were in the ark. The wicked were not. So, 
you see at the same time God's wrath against sin is great. He de- I mean, he destroys the, the whole earth. And yet you see his mercy is great that he warns Noah and Noah builds the ark and, and you know, the Lord saves humanity, the eight souls in the ark. Again, there's another planned destruction, in this case, Sodom and Gomorrah, because the Lord's going to go down and visit and, and, and say, you know, the, the, the cries about Sodom and Gomorrah have come to me. What's he talking about? Have you ever prayed to the Lord about some wickedness that is ongoing and you cannot get any kind of relief in this earth? It doesn't have to be that that it doesn't have to be that grand though. It doesn't even have to be on that scale. It could be at work. It could also be that your rulers are corrupt. Anywhere in between. You, you cry out for, for relief. Dear Lord, I'm suffering injustice. When will you avenge? As a matter of fact, the Psalms do, the, the, the Psalms do this all the time. We're dying out here, O oh Lord. Where are you? They're killing us out there. Rise up. Defend your church. Defend your congregation. Absolutely. Lots of Americans are rediscovering the imprecatory Psalms that for 100 years went dormant. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean oppression is good, but the Lord works some good out of it. I mean that's that's true, but it is okay to to cry out for for you know restitution in this life. Now the Lord's answer may be no or not yet. The cries that He's hearing are the laments of the saints. So if you find yourself hypothetically in the situation where you are lamenting to the Lord about some ongoing injustice or grave sin or wickedness that is near you or around you, and you're crying out, how long, O Lord? No, the Lord does hear. He's heard the cries coming up about Sodom and Gomorrah, and so now the Lord is going to go down and see, is, is it really as bad as they say it is? Now, he, he knows he's God. It's not that he doesn't know, but this is written for our instruction. The Lord hears the cries. He's going to come and investigate, and, and are, are they justified? And spoiler, they're entirely justified. Their wickedness is great. So Abraham's question is, okay, you reveal to me, dear Lord, you're going to destroy these people, but are you going to sweep away the, the, the righteous with the wicked? Because after all, who does Abraham have in mind? His nephew Lot, who lives in Sodom. Is Lot a righteous man? Yes. Lot is a righteous man. I did not say Lot is a perfect man. So much of Genesis is tied in with what what does it mean to be righteous? Well, when we hear the word righteousness, the one word that should immediately pop into our head every single time is what? Faith. Yes. Right? This is straight out of Romans. Because when I tell you that Lot is a righteous man, you're going to go, eh. But if I tell you that, that Lot is a faithful man, you'll go, oh, yeah, yeah, he is. You see? Yeah, I mean, this is what the sermon's about today, by the way. So, you know, just, just pay attention. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert. Yeah. Uh, yeah, what, what does holiness mean? Righteousness is going to be basically a synonym for faith, and we're going to get that from Genesis. Abram believed the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Abraham gets a little, gets a little sneak peek of the inner Trinitarian conversation. What a gift. What a blessing. But of course, what's revealed to him is uh, frightening. Because what what he hears of the Lord is his impending wrath. And so Abraham, he's concerned for his nephew Lot. Are you going to wipe away the righteous along with the wicked? Now, this this is our prayer as well, right? Because there is an impending judgment. If you don't feel the impendingness of the judgment, 
I can't help you. Like, we all have a sense this can't go on forever. This wickedness is getting so great. The Lord, the Lord's going to have to act at some point. I mean, you, you, you read the Bible enough, you realize the Lord doesn't let this kind of wickedness go on forever. Judgment is coming. Right. Sure. And so, we're kind of in the place of Abraham. Lord, are you going to sweep away the righteous with the wicked? In the case of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, the answer is no. At the end of time, the answer is also no. Right? That is, we may, we're going to be delivered into the Lord's kingdom. It might be through death, but we will not be delivered into eternal death. Right? Whereas the wicked will be. And again, the distinction between life and death, lightness and darkness, is faith. Right? That's what righteousness consists of. That's very important because we're going to keep saying Lot is a righteous man, but my, it is not going to look like it. Yes. I mean, like I said, the, the, the years line up so that Abraham would have heard the preaching of Shem. And, you know, Abraham is, is passing this on to his own household to include Lot. So now Abraham is going to negotiate for Sodom. This is, this is petitionary prayer. That is, he's, he's bringing requests to the Lord on behalf of another. Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, if I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. First of all, I have to say, this Sunday is the Sunday of the Canaanite woman doing the same thing with Jesus. You know, Jesus says, I've come for the, for the, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay, but even the children eat what falls from the master's table. I mean, or even the dogs eat what falls from the master's table. I mean, it, she's, she's brave to the point of almost being foolhardy. But what she has in mind are two things. Jesus can do it, and my daughter needs it. She's willing to suffer any indignity because of those two things. And Jesus tests her faith, and, and the test indicates her faith is genuine. And he praises her for her faith, and she becomes an example of faith for all of us. Like, our prayer should be like that. This woman, I mean, she's Canaanite. She shouldn't exist, right? If... Right, supposed to have been wiped out. Nonetheless, here she is, and she knows it. She doesn't argue with Jesus about anything he says, except, but you can do this, Lord, and my daughter is sick. And he, and he marvels at her faith. It's, it's a wonderful thing. Um, likewise, Abraham, he knows that the triune God is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, raining hellfire on them. And what does Abraham do? He places himself between God and Sodom and Gomorrah and says, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's, that's something. I mean, Abraham could have said, oh, you're going to destroy it, and, and he hightails it out of there. But he doesn't. He pleads for Sodom and Gomorrah. He stands between God and, 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 and his wrath and the object of his wrath, and he pleads for them. Well, surely you won't destroy the city for the sake of 50, Right? Yes, then he begins the biggest, <laughs> the biggest haggling session ever. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again, he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He said, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. So Abraham goes back to Mamre, kind of home base at this point. 
Abraham is still kind of nomadic, but Abraham's kind of like the tabernacle. He does, he does wander, but he stays in spots for a bit. Abraham, he's, he's very brave. He's, he's, he's very faithful. And, and notice the way that Abraham speaks. He's very conciliatory. Because he knows the Lord is he's about to pour out his wrath on the cities. If, if, you know, if, far be it for me to, to, you know. but he gets the Lord down to, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. It's a great example of prayer. Is Abraham ever rebuked for his prayer? No, he's, he's praised for it. The Lord answers him. Now, again, spoilers, there weren't 10 righteous. So whether it was 35 or 25, in the end, didn't make much difference. It does demonstrate that the Lord's, the Lord's wrath is just. This is not like an emotional snap for the Lord. As a matter of fact, he, he's waited patiently enough for Sodom and Gomorrah that the outcry among the righteous in the region has, has gone up to him and he, it's deafening to him. Right? He, he, he comes in and says, well, I, I keep hearing about Sodom and Gomorrah. The region would be around. Yeah, right, right, in, in the area. Okay, chapter 19. The two angels came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. When Lot saw them, he rose to meet them and bowed himself with his face to the earth and said, my lords, please turn aside to your servant's house and spend the night and wash your feet. Then you may rise up early and go your way. Okay, so you have two angels. Um, these are these are the two men from the previous chapter. Right, exact, yes, exactly. And in the Hebrew, it does have the, the definite article. So um, the two angels, that is, the two of them that, are, that were not the Lord. And um, as, as you can imagine, uh, the, the Jews had all kinds of mythology about who these were. This was like Gabriel and Raphael and Michael. And um, I'm kind of with Luther. Look, if the Bible doesn't give us that much detail, speculation is not going to be fruitful or profitable. <laughs> right, right, right. They're, they're from God, and it's not evident to the Sodomites, that is, the men of Sodom, that these are angels, right? They appear as men. It's not for nothing that Abraham recognizes their identity, whereas the men of Sodom don't. Now, where is Lot? Lot is sitting at the gate. What's he doing? He's the first person a new, a new traveler is going to meet. And what's Lot going to say? Okay, listen. The men of this city are crazy. Actually, they're really wicked, and they're, and they're going to prey upon you. Come into my house. I'll wash your feet. I'll put you up for the night. Then you can go on your way. You do not want to be outside, especially at night. They do wicked, disgusting things there. They prey upon travelers, the, the poor, the weak. Don't be out there. Come to my house. Remember this later when Lot doesn't look so great. But, but this is what Lot's doing. He's, he's in the gate. He's trying to rescue people from the wickedness of the men of Sodom. Now, they said, no, we will spend the night in the town square. But he pressed them strongly. So they turned aside to him and entered his house. And he made them a feast and baked unleavened bread, and they ate. So again, Lot is demonstrating hospitality. Lot is being forceful about it. One, because that is, that is kind of like that part of the world. That's how you do things. No, 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 you eat. You come in, you eat. But more than that, he also knows what happens if they spend the night in the town square. You don't want that. Verse 4, But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. <laughs> Moses makes it very clear which men of the city were involved in this. All of them. Why is that important? Remember when Abraham negotiated with the Lord for ten righteous? Moses tells us there are not ten righteous. All of them. And all of them doesn't just mean all the men of the city. 
it also means, you know, the mayor, the city council, I mean, all the, all the powerful men, all the men whose job it was to stop this kind of thing, they were participating. And this is why the cries are reaching the Lord, because the men who should have been putting a stop to this, they're involved in it. The more things change. Verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people, to the last man, surrounded the house. And they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. So, hey, Lot, we saw two men enter your house. Uh, where are they? We want to know them. So in, in Hebrew, the verb yada. Um, oddly enough, that show where like all the actors were were Jews, uh, they used yada as a cover for the very same thing. You know, yada yada yada. That was a Seinfeld thing, right? Um, the the verb yada means to know, with the subtext that when it comes to knowing somebody, it means to lay with them, right? So that we may know them, it doesn't mean get to know them. It means Adam knew his wife. Verse 6, Lot went out to the men at the entrance, shut the door after him, and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. Lot, yeah, I mean, Lot, Lot is so, he, he's trying to plead with them, and he he's he's more interested in his hospitality than he is in being a father, and that's that's sinful on his part. His job is to protect his daughters, not offer them to the men of Sodom. Um, and of course, you notice the men of Sodom are not interested in women. So when when you read Luther and and many of the church fathers about Lot, they are very quick to defend Lot. Not saying that what he did, none of them ever say that what he did was right, but. Either he's he's afraid for his life, and he's just he's he's so like you know focused, right? Yeah, he's he's trying to buy time. Or verse nine, but they said, "Stand back!" And they said, "This fellow came to sojourn, and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them." They pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down, but the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. So, right, so Lot, remember Lot is not from Sodom. He travels from, from Ur of the Chaldees with, with Abram. And when Abram decides to settle, he, he gives Lot the choice. Lot picks Sodom. And so Lot is a sojourner. He's not, he, he's not from there. And the men of the town are throwing that back at him. Well, look, you, you, think, you think you're our judge? You think you can judge me? I mean, stop me if you've heard this one before. But are you the judge of me? And so the, the, the travelers, the, 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 the angels, they reach out of the door. They grab Lot, pull him inside. And the Lord strikes them, the, the, the men of Sodom with blindness so they couldn't, they couldn't find the door and open it. Verse 12. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city? Bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place, because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and said to his sons-in-law, who were to marry his daughters, Up, get out of this place, for the Lord is about to destroy the city. But he seemed to his sons-in-law to be jesting. So... Again, stop me if you've heard this one. Lot is trying to warn about God's impending judgment, and they didn't take him seriously. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's exactly. It's Noah all over again. In some ways, it's us. So now is as good a time as any. Let's go to Romans 1. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Who's they? Pagans. 
right? The heathen. In other words, look, there's enough of God in creation. You can at least deduce that God exists from that. You're not going to get to the Trinity. You're definitely not going to get to justification by faith by looking at creation. But you can at least deduce that there is a God and that you owe him something morally because he, he would have made you too. So they're without, and this is Paul saying they're without excuse. And this is always the question that we have about, well, what if someone didn't hear the gospel? Paul says they're without excuse. Verse 21, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and, ex and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Right? That's describing idolatry, paganism. Right? This, is what, this is the definition of paganism. You exchange the glory of God for the glory of created things, whether it's human beings, birds, you know, Marduk was, what was Marduk? A fish? Like a half man, half fish? I mean, these idols are, are weird, but they're, they're all going to be related to created things. I mean, the idol itself is created, and it's going to, going to be depicting a created thing. Therefore, God gave them up in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than, than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So this is describing advanced paganism, what that becomes, right? Dis disgusting bedroom habits. And, and, and what's that? It's crystal clear for this day and age. But, but, but oddly enough, it has an answer, and that is you drive a wedge between Jesus and Paul. Well, Jesus preached a gospel of radical inclusion, but then that meanie Paul comes and tries to, to re-Judaize everything. Now, the author of the epistle to the Galatians is the last thing from a Judaizer you're ever going to find. I mean, he's, he was endangered because of being opposed to the Judaizers. But that's, it's called the new perspective on Paul, right? It, it tries to drive a wedge between Jesus and Paul for that reason. You read Paul and you go, this is so obvious. So what they do is they just say, well, that's Paul. You know, we don't, we don't have to listen to Paul. He isn't Jesus. But, but you notice that it's not just, hey, you know, we're all sinners. Paul's not speaking that way at all. These sins are of a particularly disgusting nature, and that is that they are opposed to nature. I mean, the, the, there is kind of a functional Marcionism that says, well, the Old Testament, that's a different God, or God isn't like that anymore, right? And, and, and many times they'll throw it back at you and say, well, uh, if you're so big into Leviticus, like, do you still wear mixed fabrics? Because that's, stop it. <laughs> um, so, notice in verse 26, that kind of sin is one that God gives them over to. So when they persist in wickedness, God gives them over into it. This is a lot like Pharaoh, right? First couple of, of plagues, Pharaoh hardens his heart, but after, what is it, four or five plagues? Six plagues? If for the sake of five, would we? <laughs> right. Not only does Pharaoh harden his heart, but God also hardens it. Right. So, likewise, these pagans, they're going to harden themselves against God, and eventually God's going to give them over into, okay, you want to oppose creation? He's going to, he, he delivers them into that sin, and now you see not only that they're exchanging natural relations for unnatural ones, but they receive in their bodies the penalty for it. In other words, it, it destroys their body. Foreknowledge, yeah. For knowledge, the Lord knows what's going to happen. That doesn't necessarily mean he's caused it. So God knows that sin is going to happen, but God didn't cause sin to happen. But that doesn't mean that, we, that he caused it. That's, that's foreknowledge. Anyway, one last thing, and that is that 
among the same rainbow flag crowd, there is often an attempt to retell the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, that their great sin was not sodomy, but it was inhospitality. So um, just categorically, the sin of Sodom was sodomy. Um, it was not inhospitality. Well, well, we'll pick up the middle of the story next week then. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.